Watch out. Thank you. I heard one voice. Good morning. Thank you. What a great day it is to be in the Lord's house, and we would like to welcome you to Fredonia this morning. It is such a joy to be here all together and knowing that we can come together and worship Jesus Christ together. And so I'm so thankful that each one of you are here today. Psalms 85, 12 says, Lord of hosts, happy is the person who trusts in you. And I pray that we've all placed our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and if not, I pray today is that day. And so um, this morning, let's be happy in the Lord and bring joy before his throne. Let's all stand together today as we begin our time of worship together with trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey, trust and true we need to place our trust in Jesus Christ and then obey to follow him each and every day you may be seated good morning I welcome everybody to freedom you Baptist Church this morning on this beautiful rainy day uh, got a few announcements here today um, first announcement since your kid deposits are due today 75 for children and 150 dollars for adults um, there's a drop box in the back hallway back here right in front of jeremy's old office if you want to place your uh, deposit in there if you have not done so already and we also have a video for Central kid so drew if you're ready for that video we will watch that right now <laughs> Love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are get ready to be wow that Citra Kid Camp 2024 as you experience God's great gift. Keep your hands and feet in the ride at all times. And prepare for the wow factor. Got several other announcements, um, and we won't go over all of them, but um, 
One announcement we'll make sure you're aware of is next Saturday uh, we'll have our senior adult Valentine's luncheon. Uh, that's at 12 o'clock. Today is the last day to sign up for that. So if you have not signed up and you're planning on going, please sign. Uh, the sign-up sheet is in the back hallway right by the office. Uh, so if you sign up, we'll indicate whether you want chicken or pork loin. We would appreciate that. We would like for everybody to come uh, if you're uh, able. Um, Gridirons Men Conference, you can see that. That's going to come up in June. A uh, group of guys have been going to that for several years. If you'd like to go to that, um, <coughs> you can see that uh, announcement. Pastor Search Committee, uh, they would appreciate you continue to pray for them. Uh, they are getting down to, you know, just the top three or four or five uh, folks that they have uh, looked upon and God has led them to. So continue to keep them in your prayers, if you will. <coughs> Um, Wednesday night services, Dylan Reeder is going to lead us over the next three weeks, so 6.30 each week in the Kenneth Clayton Sunday School Room, which is in the old nursery, um, so they'll be there for the time being until the uh, renovations start, which we voted on that last week, uh, that passed with a 96% approval. Um, we are waiting on uh, C.J. Bright to give us... Um, an idea of when they'll be able to start, and that's supposed to happen pretty soon. So <clears throat> when that happens, we're going to need all the help we can get because we've got to move everything out of the back. Chairs, tables, desk, copier, safe room, everything has got to be moved. Um, and we're going to have to move some of it to the youth house, possibly some of it to the parsonage, and possibly some of it to the gym. So <clears throat> if you are able to help with that, when the time comes, just be... Looking on Facebook, we'll try to send out a text, but we're going to need all hands on deck that can help to try to get all that moved. So um, uh, let's see. We've got Wild Game Supper coming up on Saturday, uh, February the 24th. All men are welcome. Contact Dylan Reeder, Zach High if you got any questions. That's a brotherhood event. And then we've got the baby bottle boomerang. You can see the baby bottles. That's still going on. Uh, if you want to take one of the bottles and fill it up with change or a check, uh, we'd appreciate you doing that for first choice um, and we're going to have a video for that and before we play that video Drew we've got one uh, last announcement uh, life groups of course started back last week and if you're over a life group the study group questions are in Brother Hunter's old office on his desk if you need those so the questions are there if you need them so uh, Drew if you're ready for that video for first choice the earth can feel like a frightening place. We wonder, how can we bring children into this dangerous and unsettled world? But God answered. He sent Isaac, the promised baby of a barren woman, that one day became the nation of Israel. God sent baby Moses floating in a basket down the river Nile to eventually rescue that nation from slavery. In a time of chaos and injustice, the child Samuel was dedicated to God as a prophet who would later crown kings. After centuries of silence, God sent John, the babe in the womb who was the first to recognize the Messiah. And he sent his son, Jesus, the one who would save the world. God's answer often begins with a child a baby provided in unexpected, miraculous ways. Today, a woman facing an unplanned pregnancy needs hope in the midst of despair. Even though her child is unexpected, they are created by God with a plan and a future. Become a part of their story. Give a gift and change our world, one mom and one baby at a time. got one more announcement I just thought about. Um, <clears throat> hard to believe, but BBS will be here before we know it. Uh, it's, you know, it's not too far off. June will be here before we know it. Uh, Nicole McQuarrie has agreed to be the interim director for VBS for us this year uh, since we don't have Brother Hunter anymore. Um, so she will be reaching out here in the next days and weeks and months trying to get folks to start signing up to help with that. 
So just um, remember that and keep VBS uh, in the back of your mind and make that as a matter of prayer as well. So at this time, Brian Cobb, would you lead us in a word of prayer, please? when you think about what real worship really means to you, um, think in your mind for just a second, what, what does worship really look like? In your head, are you thinking, oh, it's a Sunday morning, you come to church and you, you sit back and you sing songs and you listen to a sermon and, and that's what worship is. But you know, worship is not just that. It's, it's, that's only a small, tiny part of it even. But worship is our love song to God and his love song back to us. And so when we sit back and we just think about how amazing our God is, how big of a God that we serve, how amazing that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, for us because of that love that he does have for us, how amazing is it that we can take just a tiny portion of our time and give praise back to him. And so this morning, as we come together, Let's think about what real worship looks like. And it doesn't have to be in this building. It could be outside these doors. Our worship goes with us all throughout the week. And so let's take just a moment to just reflect on how good good God is in each of our lives. If you would, let's all stand together this morning. Sing together. No! 
Absolutely nothing we can ever do will ever compare to who God really is. And so this morning, we're going to sing one more song, and I'll just be honest with you. This is probably one of my favorite praise songs. I absolutely, I love this song. And I'll tell you the one downfall of this song. It's one of those that if you're singing the words to it, you have to look at the screens because they never repeat themselves. But you know, every bit of this song is all worship of a Jesus Christ and of a God who created our entire universe. He created our world. He created the land. He created the seas. But guys, the truth about it is he created each and every one of you too. And so um, this song is all about the God of creation, the God who's above everything else, all of the issues in our lives, all of the problems that we face. God is bigger than anything we can come in contact with. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the veil. out in glory to God. It says that even the rocks will cry out in praise to him. All of creation exalts our God. And what a great display of God's might and his power and his majesty that we can see. God doesn't need us to worship him today, but he desires for us to want to worship him today. If the stars were made to worship, so will I.
breaks down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in heaven. Christ, he will never leave us nor forsake us. The Bible tells us that. And if the Bible says it, it's truth. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you. Those folks that don't like repeated song phrases ought to love that song. <laughs> so will I, amen. I want to share with you, again, remind you a little bit, the last two Sundays with a uh, Sunday of snow in between, I, I preached on doing God's work God's way. The illustration that's in the Bible is when David desired to bring the Ark of the Covenant that was at Benadab in southern part of the nation and bring it to Jerusalem in the center of the nation because he wanted God's presence to be the center and at the center of everything that was to be done. I, that's awesome, isn't it? Fredonia Baptist Church, do you want Jesus Christ to be the center of everything that is done here for his glory? But in order to do that, he thought he could follow tradition. The, the, the ark had been on the ox cart for over 20 years, so they decided to build a new ox cart and bring it up. As the oxen were pulling the ark, they went across a threshing floor, and the ox stumbled. Yuza, who was following it, said, Man, I don't want the ark to fall, so he put out his hand to steady the ark, and he died immediately. David was sad. He was afraid. Now why? Because he was doing God's work. That was God's will. God's will was for that ark to be in Jerusalem. But he went about it the wrong way. I don't know about you, that gets my attention. Because I, I see a lot of things of God's that needs to be done. But God, how would you have me do it? In other words, doing it God's way is important. The song that we just sing about obedience, and then the first one we sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way. We think trust is, is important, but it's trust and obey. It's combination working together. So trusting the Lord and not obeying Him is really not real faith. 
it's really not real trust. Obedience with him without the faith and the trust is nothing more than pharisaical and self-righteousness saying, I can do it on my own. Do y'all catch that? I hope you do. These are important. But God desires for us to walk with him step by step. Now, again, David found out that the ark was kept at Obed-Edom's house. That's the next child that's born here at Fredonia. I want you that person to name him Obed-Edom. And let me know about it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I love Obed-Edom. Oh, isn't that a good name? Obed-Edom kept the, kept the ark at his house, and it says he was blessed in his whole house. During this three-month period of time, David did what he did not do before. He inquired of the Lord. That meant he was praying and seeking and studying. That's why you want to pray with an open Bible. You connect prayer with Bible study and Bible reading. That, that's the way it works, trusting and obeying. If you trust him but you don't know what he's saying through the word of God, you can't do the work of obedience. So it's trust and obey. He found out that it wasn't an ox cart that you should bring the Ark of the Covenant on. It was the shoulders of Levites. So three months later, he went back and he gets the Ark. And I want to bring that up to us. That's where we are today. And look, if you would, in 1 Chronicles. I know you've been looking at, at 2 Samuel, but we're in 1 Chronicles. They cover the same story, much like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially. They're called the Synoptic Gospels, the same, synonym. And John is the Johannian. It's a little different. Now, it covers much, but he covers the... The, mainly the southern ministry of Jesus, the Judean ministry. And he covers things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke does not cover. But First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, they cover a lot of the same things along with kings. Now let me read part of this. I'm not going to read all of chapter 15, but I do want to read some. So if you have your Bibles, follow along. First Chronicles 15, verse 1 is where I'll start. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. The temple had not been built and would not be built yet. David said, No one can carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. This statement comes after Yuza died. He discovered that because he had not known that. He had not inquired of the Lord. But in three months, man, he spent his time in the Bible seeking God in prayer. He was, he was stressed over what had happened to Yuza. Wouldn't you be? He was afraid, has the idea of, of intense anger, intense stress. He didn't want somebody else to die because of his disobedience. Do you have that? That's why it's so important for you parents, not only to tell your children as they should follow the Lord, but demonstrate to them how they could follow the Lord. Have you ever heard of pictures worth a thousand words? Living out your life before God and sharing the word of God with them will bring great benefits. Somewhere along the line, they had forgotten how the ark was to be carried. And so Yuza died. But now he finds out the right way to do it. Now listen to verse 13 for because, of, of 1 Chronicles 15. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him. If you underline or highlight in your Bibles, underline the words consult him or pray to him, whatever your version might say. Go to the Lord. Don't miss it. Don't assume, don't presume that, okay, this is good. God, I'm saved. I'm, I've got this idea. Let's do it. No, consult him about the proper order. So the priests, the Levites, sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, and the children of Israel, <clears throat> the children of the Levites, bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded. Now underline something else according to the word of the Lord. Would you underline that or highlight that in your Bible? According to the word of the Lord. 
if you really want God's blessing and God doing a great work, find out what the Bible says about anything, about children, about life, about marriage. You don't consult Hollywood about what marriage is. You don't even consult the Supreme Court of the United States of what marriage is. You consult the creator of marriage about what you also find out when life begins. The Bible says that he, we were conceived at the very moment of conception, there's life. That's a human being. The only difference in that little one, that early in the womb, and a child that is born is time and location. Time and location. So God desires that. We want to find out how God works. So today, I, I'm, I want to try to do this. There's so many things that you could discover about how the ways of God. But I want to share three of them, and we've sung about them today. We really have. The first one is prayer. The Bible makes prayer just definite thing. Uh, David didn't pray the first time, but after Yuza died, he prayed. Don't make the mistake and then pray. Pray before the mistake is made. And when I say pray, it's got to be consulting the Lord. It can't be just saying, okay, Lord, I want this, I want that. Lord, heal me. <clears throat> no, you do your best to find out what God says about the matter. You find out what God wants and desires in our lives. What are the ways of God? Prayer. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. It wasn't what David thought was proper. It was what God said was proper. You can think your way all day long, and it can be dead wrong. And in David's case, it was dead wrong. Yuza died. Philippians 4, 6, and this is one of those verses you need to know, memorize. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. What? Everything. What does everything mean in the Greek? Everything. Y'all got it. He got it. It means everything. There's nothing too small, nothing too big. In everything, make your request, your supplications, with thanksgiving known to the Lord. Why would he put thanksgiving in there? Can I tell you something? Listen closely. It's just you and me talking. Without an attitude of gratitude, you'll miss God's voice every time. I've never met a Holy Spirit-led person that was not thankful. If you want to get far away from God, start with an unthankful spirit. Oh, God's done me wrong. Nothing works out for me. I've had the worst life ever. You know what you're doing? You're building on that foundation of unthankfulness and developing an attitude of ingratitude. And God says, be thankful in all things, in everything, in thanksgiving, let your requests be known to the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says, pray without ceasing. You can't pray too much. People say, well, you need to get off your knees and get with it. When you get off your knees, don't quit praying. You continue praying, Lord, help me, I need your leadership. Step by step, I need your direction. There's no place in life where prayer is not necessary and important in your walk with Christ. It shows our dependence, and we acknowledge it. The first time David tried it without prayer, look what happened. In 1 Chronicles 15, 13, he said, We did not consult him. Now, I wrote this down. Listen carefully. What does consult mean? What he says about the matter, no matter what is the matter. In other words, we consult him about the issue that we're dealing with, no matter what, we consult him. No matter what we do, God, what would you have me to do? God, where would you have me to go? God, what would you have me to say? Everything, we trust him. We love to do things on our own. Guess where evolution came from? A man who wanted 
to do his own thing without God and without accountability. His name was Charles Darwin. Evolution is not a science. It is a philosophy. It used to be called the, the how many of you went to school when it was called the theory of evolution? Y'all, y'all, everybody's my age, I guarantee you that's what it's called. But in the last years, it's become what? The science of evolution. And we heard, will the science lie? Sure did about, sure did about COVID. <laughs> oh, I got to keep six, six feet away from you. Oh, he, he's not wearing a mask. And what, guess what they've discovered? Six feet was brought up from 1917 when they were looking at, at a flu and they said, that might be a good thing. Let's try six feet. No scientific word at all, just six feet. Truthfully, the mask. Guess, guess what happens through the mask? Most of those particles, especially the kind that I could wear and I could breathe, you know, they'd go right through it. Now again, don't get, don't get mad, but COVID proves science half the time does not know truth. Now, I know, man, I, I, I'm catching it by some folks, I know. But it, look at the evidence. Fauci's even talking about it now. You know, the mistakes that was made. And they told us, no, this is science. Evolution is a philosophy. Religion. I know Christianity is put in a category of the world religions. I had to take that in... I had to take it in college, and I had to take world religions in seminary. But can I tell you what Christianity is more than, quote, a religion? A relationship. Religion is trying to get to God on our own merit. Guess what? You will never make it. Your merit's not sufficient. Your goodness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. But God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, that he would die on the cross, becoming the perfect sacrifice, taking our sin upon him so we could be forgiven when we by faith ask him to forgive us of our sins as we repent from our sin in our way and say, God, not my way, but your way. I didn't say that when I was saved, but guess what? It really was my heart. I said, God, I'm tired of trying to do it my way, even as a 12-year-old boy. My way will never make it. I'm coming to you, doing it your way. I turned from my way, and I turned to you. Come into my life and save me. He changed my life as a 12-year-old boy. He can change your life no matter how old you are. I think the oldest person that I've been able to uh, talk to about the Lord and help them come to the Lord and then baptize them was an 86-year-old deacon's wife. <laughs> deacon's wife, yes, they need to be saved. Okay? But I'll never forget it, you know? she came. I, it was a long time ago. She came up out of that water at church. She'd never heard anybody shout, but they did that day. Woo! It woke some of them up. Amen. You know? And so God can do it. One of the oldest men I've baptized was about a 75-year-old deacon. Seriously. I never forget what he said. He said, last Sunday I came and heard G preach, Brother Bert. And then I heard Dr. Adrian Rogers and Charles Stanley preach. And I finally, I knew I needed to be saved because he said, when I got out of the war out of the army, I came home and decided that it was time for me to be a Christian. He said, I made that decision without Jesus Christ coming into my heart. said, I've been a deacon, I've been a Sunday school teacher, I've been a treasurer of a church, I've gone on mission trips, but last Sunday night I got down on my knees in my living room and I asked Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. Have you done that? Has there been a time in your life, whether you were 12 or 86, or younger, or older, where Jesus Christ became Lord of your life. If you haven't, you've got religion and not Jesus. In order to go to heaven, it's Jesus and not religion when you come in. We did a program about witnessing, 
And one of the questions that is asked, if you were to die right now and you stood before God and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? It's a good question, isn't it? If you were to die today, I don't care how old you are, I look at the obituaries and I see all ages in there. And you were to die and you stand before God and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? I remember one of the ladies that we were witnessing to, she said, I'd tell him I was a Presbyterian. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, I'm a Baptist, but that's not what I'd, that's what I'd tell him. We tried to witness to her, and she closed the door and said, well, I'm a Presbyterian. And uh, I hope she got saved. I hope she is saved. Listen, the only thing that God will open his doors of heaven in you is when you have trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's the only way. There's no other way. There's no other way besides Jesus Christ into his presence. So here it is. Man, prayer demonstrates that we're doing it God's way. It's an obedience is professed. Do you remember John chapter 11 when Jesus prayed for Lazarus? It says, because of the people who are standing by, I said this may, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus didn't have to pray out loud, but he prayed out loud so that the people would hear him praying and knowing that they needed to pray to go to the Father. Jesus demonstrated that we need to pray about everything. Matthew 10, 32 says it this way. Therefore, everyone who will confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who's in heaven. Isn't that something? There's something about confession to others in your faith in Christ. One of the first things that needs to happen after a person gets saved is for them to profess Christ to someone else. Sometimes they do it in front of the church. Sometimes they do it with their family. Sometimes they do it with a friend. But he says... Profess me, if you're not brave enough, if you haven't had a heart change that gives you courage enough to say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, he is saying it's really not real. It's really not real. It says if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, there's something about it being lived out, prayed out, and let others see Jesus in you. That's what it is. Through prayer, we do everything. And then everything by faith. The first thing that you need to know if you're going to do it God's way, you pray about everything through the Word of God, in the Word of God, consulting God. The second thing that we're covering today is everything by faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says this, Without faith it is impossible to please God. Now what is faith? It's one of the most difficult words to define in the Bible. It really is. Uh, it says believe sometimes. The Greek word that is translated believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, is a Greek word that's faith. And it's a verb. It's a verb faith. You could say faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't register with our brain because belief or trust, that registers. But the Greek word that is used is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's demonstrated. S.M. Lockridge said it this way. I love this. Faith is stepping out on nothing and find yourself standing. You step out and God keeps you up when you step out in his word. Do you remember Peter? When Jesus came walking on the water and Jesus said, Lord, bid me to come to you. And Jesus said what? One word. Come. On that one word, Peter got out and started walking on the water. You say, yeah, but he sunk. But what about the other guys that were in the apostle? They never got out, out of the boat. They never, the other apostles never got out of the boat. But God, what did God do? What did Jesus do when Peter started sinking? He lifted him up and brought him back to the boat. Have you trusted the Lord? Is your faith in him and him alone? Faith, E.M. Bounds, a great prayer warrior, said this, faith thrives in an atmosphere of prayer. Do you, want your prayer. do you want your prayers to be answered? Do you want your faith to be increased? Pray about everything. 
trust the Lord about everything. Faith is not saying I have faith in God. It is doing it God's way. I demonstrate faith by obeying God. Trust and obey. I obey Him. I follow Him. I trust Him. It's demonstrated. And that's what it happened here with David. David found out Uzzah died, so what did he do? He went back to the Word of God, and he found out in Exodus chapter 25, verse 14, that only the Levites are to carry the ark on their shoulders on poles. That's the way to carry it. God gave no further instructions. If you don't believe God is very specific, start reading about how God told them to build the Ark of the Covenant, how he told them to be, build the tent of meeting, how he told them to dress the high priest. It gave every little detail. God is in the details. We don't, I don't say we don't, I'll just put it in my category. You're talking to somebody that half the time looks over the details. You know, I look in the mirror and I say I look pretty good. But then, have y'all got those mirrors that magnify? I don't like them. Son, ah! I get, when I look in the mirror, it's up there and I get way back, yeah, I look pretty good. <laughs> because I don't see the details. Come on in. God sees the details and he still loves you. That's worth shouting about if we got a shouter here. Amen? Amen. 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 God looks at the details and he still loves you. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. That's the God in him. We have faith in him. You can put faith in a God who is that way. Faith is doing it God's way. God develops faith. Real quickly, I've got to run on and get this quickly. But Abraham, we find out in Genesis 22 that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son, his only son that God gave him, by sacrificing him. And Abraham was willing. We say, I could never do that. Now, where do we first find Abraham? Get ready to follow me, guys. Okay. In Genesis chapter 11, we're introduced to Abraham. In chapter 12, he told him to get out from his father's land and go to a country that I will show you. He did that. When he got there, he had provision, and God said, I'll provide for you. He did. He said, I'm going to make you a father, and I'm going to give a son to your wife Sarah. God did. And now in Genesis 22, way over here, way many years beyond when God called him out of the earth of the Chaldees, God tells him to offer up his son, his only son Isaac. Now he didn't have to. There was a ram caught in the thicket. You know the story. But why was he willing to? Because what he had experienced in Genesis 12 what he had experienced in Genesis chapter 16. What he had experienced in Genesis chapter 20. So when he got to Genesis 22, he knew God. God will never put on you more than you can bear. God will lead you straight through. He will. You remember what he said to the church in uh, the Hebrews and the Corinthians? He says, you're having to have the milk of the word and you should be on the meat of the word. Why did he say that? Because they were back over here where they had not trusted God. You have to trust God and obey him every step of the way. If he had never left Ur of the Chaldees, Genesis 22 would have never taken place in that great story. Y'all catch how faith is developed? Faith is developed by obeying him and following him and watching him operate in your life and in my life. I need to hurry on. The third thing of God's way, prayer, faith. Y'all got that? Is worship. 
worship. Listen closely. I, I know I'm doing this a lot today, but I want you to listen. Preparing to worship is as important as worshiping. Do you know you're probably worshiping today as much as you can to the height you can because of what you've put into it before you got here? Now, what was David's ultimate goal? His ultimate goal was to get the ark in Jerusalem. But guess what happened? Let's go back to 1 Chronicles 15 again. This is so good. It says in verse 3, And David gathered all of Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place which he had prepared. He had the place that it was going to be prepared, the tent. You remember that? He already had the tent set up. He had the people ready. But some of them had to do what? Go to Obed-Edom's, get the ark, and bring it to Jerusalem. Now look at all the people that are assembled in verses 4 through verse 11. I'm not going to read all those names. But in, after, verse, after verse 11 and verse 12, he said, You're the heads of the fathers, the houses of the Levites. Now listen to this. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may be able to bring up the ark of the Lord of God to Israel to the place I prepared it. Before you go into the act of worship, you better sanctify yourself. If y'all get that, shake your head up and down. Before you come to church, you should have taken time out. Some of you needed to write a check or put money in an envelope or get online and give, however y'all give. It's an act of worship. It was an act of worship. Praying and saying, Lord, speak to you, my heart today. I need to hear you today. Preparing. He told these Levites, prepare yourself, cleanse yourself, make yourself ready. He says, sanctify yourselves. Verse 13, for because you did not do it the first time. You didn't do it right the first time. And if, you know what insanity is? Doing the same thing again and again, accepting, ex expecting a different outcome. What if David, hard-headed, and he had believed, well, if he first don't succeed, y'all can say it better than that, y'all know what it is. If he first don't succeed, what if he had that attitude? I'm going to, big, I'm going to build a bigger ox cart. In place of having two men around it, I'm going to put four men around it. In place of having two oxen uh, pulling that cart, I'm going to have six Y'all catch what I'm saying? I'm going to do the same thing again and again, but I'm going to do it better. It'll never work when it's your way and not God's way. You only dig your ditch deeper and deeper and deeper. He consulted to the Lord and he found out he was only to bring it up with the Levites, worshiping him. And what did they do? This is awesome. This is so powerful as they escorted. And you have to go back to 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, verse, uh, verse 13. I'll, I'll read verse 12 and then 13. This is the same story, but Samuel has something in it that the Chronicles did not. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of obed and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went, this is three months later, and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom in the city of David with gladness. And so it was, when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Worship. Sacrificial worship. Before, all they were doing was marching and blowing their horns and playing their instruments. Right? Right? David found out there was something as important as bringing the ark, and that's worshiping him. So they went one, 
two, three, four, five, six paces. That's as far as man can go on his own. And then they offered sacrifices. Seven, matter of fact, seven, the completion of God. Do y'all catch the worship of that? In other words, folks, listen. God can only do what God is designed to do. Man cannot do what God can do. We've got to trust him. He's the only one that sees it through. The priests, the Levites, they sanctified themselves. They brought up the ark. And one more thing, I want to share this with you, and we'll be through. Everyone participated. There was no spectators. Everybody was participating this time. He had the people blowing their horns. He had the musicians playing their strings. He had the singers singing. He had the doorkeepers, the gatekeepers. He had all of those. Everybody was participating. There was no spectators. Do you know what's wrong? One of the things that's wrong with our modern church in 2024, we've got too many spectators. We come and hear others sing. We come and watch others give. We come and hear a sermon preached. And we go home unchanged. Have you ever heard to be involved in something and to want something to succeed, you've got to invest in it? Have you invested in Fredonius Baptist Church's mission? Have you invested in the kingdom of God? Have you invested yourself? Every one of these, there was no spectators. Every one of them had something to do. They had responsibilities. This is my job. This is your job. Everybody that's a member of Fredonia Baptist Church ought to have a ministry. If you haven't, you need to find one. And not all the jobs take place, and I know I've said this before, i say it again. Not all the jobs take place in the walls of these buildings. Some of the most important tasks that will ever be done are out there in the world because the Bible says that the world will see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. How many of you think the world is watching what we're doing this morning? They're going by on Martintown Road. They're on Highway 15. They're down on Interstate 22. They know churches is meeting, but when we leave, go to a restaurant, have to run by a store, are you going to do it because the line is so long and you have to wait in line? And you have to go to Walmart and you have to be your own cashier. I remember when you had people running these things, you know? <clears throat> I understand, but why complain? Nobody's going to care. But somebody in front of you, they drop a $20 bill, and they don't know it. You see it, and you pick it up and say, I believe this is yours. I saw it fall out of your purse, out of your pocket. If you go to the gas pump, have to get gas, and you see somebody over there that doesn't know how to operate it, and you take time out and you say, do you need any help? They may say, no. Well, that's all right. They say, yeah, this thing's just not working. Say, well, you got to do this. A neighbor dies. And you're a baker. Man, you make good cakes, good pies. You make good sourdough bread. <clears throat> you know probably what would be better than a card, sympathy card? A cake a loaf of bread. You may do, be doing some of the most important work in the world in your kitchen. You may be doing some of the most important of God's work in your workshop. Making something that you can give a child. Y'all catch what, what we're talking about? We are so restricted well, I don't sing and I don't teach. I don't pray in loud in public. There's not much I can do. There's a lot you can do. No one was a spectator. Everybody had a responsibility. 
And I want to tell you one of them as we close. One of the gatekeepers or doorkeepers was a man called Obed-Edom. <laughs> Obed-Edom, he had kept the ark in his house and now willingly given it to the nation and saying, I want to be part of not only my private time with the ark or the presence of God, but I want to be a part of the corporate worship of God. Hear people say that all the time. Well, I don't go to church, but I worship God at home. Well, you need to worship God at home. Amen? Amen. But you also need cooperative worship together, sharing. But if you have cooperative worship and you say, well, this is it, and you're not worshiping God at home, you're selling yourself short as well. Here's what he did. They did God's work, God's way. Three things. Prayer, faith, and worship. I don't care what you're doing, baking cakes, teaching a Sunday school class, singing a song, or giving a testimony. There's no time when those three things are not needing to be present in what you're doing. Pray about everything. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we worship God because if we don't, the rocks will cry out. The mountains, I will do it. Would you make those three things a part of your life right now if you've been saved? If you've been saved, would you say, God, I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to trust you with all my heart, all my soul, all my might. And I want to worship you, Romans 12, 1. And that is, therefore, knowing the mercies of God, that you present your body as a what? Living sacrifice, which is your reasonable worship. Let's do it. If you decide, I'm going to make those three things, I, I, and hey, if you don't mean it, stay seated. But if you're decided, I want to make those three things a part of my life in my walk with Christ, would you just stand to your feet right now? You don't have to. If you don't mean it, don't do it. What a combination. Yeah, we're going to sing a song, but I want you to hear that one first. Because the song we sing, I love the song. It's mo it is more than a song, right? Is that the one we're going to sing? We can sing all day, and God inhabits the praises of his children. But you know what God's going to watch even closer than if you're singing or not singing? what you and I do when we walk out those doors. Amen? Y'all catch that? Prayer, faith, worship. Let's make them a part of our lives. If you've never been saved, I'll be here at the front. I want to lead you to the Lord. I want to help you know the Lord because you'll be incomplete without Him. As we sing, let us worship the Lord right now. Oh, 
want to encourage you obey the Lord as best you can uh, trust him you can trust him he loves you he cares deeply about you and let's seek him with all of our heart amen father I pray for Fredonia Baptist Church I pray that as as we're gathered here that you may have blessed us through the music through the word but father now that we go out may we serve you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Just want a couple of reminders. Reminder about Central Kid Deposits due today. And also life groups tonight. If you're not plugged into life groups, they start at 530. Uh, would love to have you there. Uh, thank everybody for being out here today. Um, we'd like to close out the service a little different if we could today. Um, we're glad to have Angela here today and Johnny and Dee. Um, Johnny and Dee, if y'all don't mind, if y'all would come down if you would. As everybody knows, this family's been through a lot over the last couple of years. And um, what we'd like to do today, um, if you're willing, we'd love for um, you to come down and put your hands on Johnny and Dee and Angela. And we would like to pray for them. So if you're willing to come down and, and lay your hands on them, uh, we would love for you to do this this time. If you can't come, if you just pray where you're at. I'm going to ask Katie Durr to open us up, Jeff High, and then Chris Bell to close us out. 